This field near Chancellorsville, Virginia, was the first major battleground of the clerk. Here on the morning of May 2nd, 1863, gray-clad Confederate infantry nervously awaited their orders to advance. Confederate artillery too stood by, eyes and ears straining for sight of the enemy. What was the status of the Confederacy as its men faced Chancellorsville? And what is as they approached Chancellorsville? Three theaters of war had been established by the Union. A supplies from reaching the Confederacy, an Eastern campaign, which had as its objective the capture of Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital, and a campaign in the West to gain control of essential Southern rule, as had the Union offensive in the West. Here, large areas had formed to the Union, and only Vicksburg, Mississippi remained as a depot for the supply lines between... In the East, however, the Union offensive to capture Richmond had continually failed. This was due in large part to the able generalship of Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy. In the late summer of 1862, Lee had launched an offensive campaign into Union territory. But the Confederates had been checked at Antietam, Maryland. But at Fredericksburg, Virginia, in the last major encounter of 1862, Union troops failed to drive the Confederates from their strong position, and the Union advance on Richmond was once again halted. Early in 1863, General Joseph Fighting Joe Hooker was placed in command of the Union Army. The objective was still Richmond. Hooker's plan was to send part of his army against Fredericksburg and the army of General Lee. The other part of Hooker's army would cross the Rappahannock River at Chancellorsville in order to attack Fredericksburg from a northwesterly direction. Lee countered by moving his main force to Chancellorsville, and there the two armies fought. With more fighting men on the field, the odds lay with the Union. But a grim surprise awaited the Union forces. A large Confederate force in a brilliant flanking movement led by Stonewall Jackson attacked wholly unprepared Union troops. The Union soldiers were driven back in confusion. The Union suffered even heavier losses as Lee's artillery and infantry opened up against the Union front. The badly whipped Union troops were forced to withdraw. The Confederates had saved Richmond, but at great cost. Among the casualties was General Lee's brilliant military aide Stonewall Jackson, mortally wounded in the fighting. Nevertheless, the Confederates had won a great victory at Chancellorsville, and they awaited the next orders of their beloved General Lee. These orders came in June of 1863. Lee and his staff began an invasion of Union territory with their army of 75,000 men. At the same time, almost parallel to this Confederate force, a much larger Union army was advancing northward under the leadership first of Hooker and then of General George Gordon Meade. Both Meade and Lee realized that their armies must meet. That encounter came near the crossroads town of Gettysburg on July 1st, 1863. In the first fierce fighting, the advancing Confederates pushed the enemy back, but within hours Union commanders had established solid lines of defense on the high ground of Cemetery Ridge and adjacent hills. Almost parallel to Cemetery Ridge was Seminary Ridge, the major emplacement of the greatly outnumbered Confederates. Here at Gettysburg, the fate of the Southern cause would be largely determined. For never again would the Confederacy have the manpower or materiel to mount an invasion into Union territory. The next day, the attacking Confederates had some success, but the main Union line remained intact. Concentrated Confederate cannon fire opened the fighting at Gettysburg on the afternoon of the third day, July 3rd. This was an attempt to soften up the Union positions before a storming of Cemetery Ridge by Confederate infantry. Hitting the center of the Union stronghold was a group of 15,000 men 
the flower of the Confederate Army, led by General George Pickett. It was an act of unmatched courage. Under the deadly accuracy of Union cannon, thousands of Pickett's men fell. But a few made their way to the top of Cemetery Ridge. For 20 dreadful minutes, Pickett's men engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, only to be thrown back by fresh Union reserves. With this action, the Battle of Gettysburg was ended. More than 7,000 Americans of both sides were dead. Thousands more were wounded. Never again would the Confederate Army fight an offensive campaign in the East. In the West, meantime, under Ulysses S. Grant, other Union armies were achieving major victories. The river port of Vicksburg, Mississippi remained the Union objective. This stronghold was the single obstacle preventing Grant's control of the entire Mississippi River. Early in 1863, Grant, in a skillful move, crossed from the east to the west bank of the Mississippi River, marched southward, and then crossed the river again below Vicksburg. Then, in a series of brilliant maneuvers and swift victories, Grant drove north and east and finally turned to drive the Confederate Army back into Vicksburg. The position of the Confederate defenders of Vicksburg was extremely perilous. At their backs lay the river. Before them, encircling the city in 15 miles of breastworks, lay Grant's troops and murderous artillery. In late May, the Union artillery began to shell the city. The firing continued day after day. After six weeks, battered Vicksburg and some 30,000 troops were surrendered by the Confederate General John C. Pemberton. Vicksburg fell on July 4th. The Confederacy had suffered its second major loss of 1863. Of the Union victory at Vicksburg, President Lincoln remarked, the father of waters again goes unvexed to the sea. Thus, in 1863, Victory at Gettysburg smashed the Confederate offensive in the east. The capture of Vicksburg in the west gave the Union complete control of the Mississippi, cutting off the Confederate states west of the Mississippi from the war. The Union offensive in the west shifted to the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, a strategic railroad center held by the Confederates. The struggle for Chattanooga at first involved Confederate General Braxton Bragg, who held the city originally, and Union General William S. Rosecrans, who maneuvered Bragg out of the city. Rosecrans attempted to capture Bragg's army, but suffered a serious defeat at Chickamauga Creek, near Chattanooga, in September 1863. Rosecrans was pushed back into Chattanooga. Supplies and reinforcements to save the situation were rushed by Grant, now in command of the Western Theater of War. Thus, late in November, under Grant's leadership, Union troops defeated the Confederates at Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. This gave the Union complete control of the vital Chattanooga Rail Center. For Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, the defeats of 1863 raised serious problems. Confederate manpower was dwindling. Food, ammunition, and clothing were in short supply. President Lincoln faced another kind of problem. For some time, he had sought a competent general to lead the war in the East. Early in 1864, Grant, after his impressive victories in the West, was named by Lincoln General-in-Chief of all the Union armies. The Eastern campaign was now his. Determined to take Richmond, Grant, in May of 1864, moved his large army of many troops and heavy guns across the Rapidan River into that part of Virginia known as the Wilderness. The dense forests made for a difficult advance, and many Union soldiers were killed by bullets of Confederate snipers. Such tactics slowed the Union offensive. In one of the most terrifying engagements of the Wilderness Campaign, the two forces clashed in a forest set aflame by artillery fire. Grant's forward push was checked, so he moved to the southeast, but Lee countermoved to confront him again, first at the Battle of Spotsylvania, 
and again at Cold Harbor. Cold Harbor was an empty victory, for the Confederates suffered irreplaceable losses. Grant and his officers decided to change the Union line of approach to Richmond. From the middle of 1864 to the early weeks of 1865, Grant's army, from well-placed breastworks, laid siege to the railroad town of Petersburg, 20 miles south of Richmond, and to Richmond itself. The superior weapons of the Union and its larger supply of manpower were turning the tide against the Confederacy in the East. In the West, where General William T. Sherman had succeeded Grant in command, Union forces were helping to close the ring. From Chattanooga, Sherman moved against the Confederate city of Atlanta, Georgia, with the objective of inflicting all possible damage on Confederate war resources. Sherman's campaigns into the Lower South left a trail of destroyed railroad equipment and other war materiel. Reaching the fortified city of Atlanta in July 1864, Sherman laid siege to it in one of the most bitter campaigns of the entire war. Of this campaign, Sherman later said, if the people raise a howl about my barbarity and cruelty, I will answer that war is war and not popularity seeking. With ruined Atlanta in Union hands, Sherman and his army began their famous march to the sea, which ended in the capture of the city of Savannah. Again, Sherman's men efficiently destroyed the South's railroads, resources, and resistance. While Sherman marched to the sea, the Confederates mounted a desperate attack against Nashville, Tennessee, to gain a base from which to strike eastward. But this attack was quickly beaten down. By the close of 1864, the Union strategy had been almost fulfilled. Like the Confederate states west of the Mississippi, those of the Lower South were all but removed from the fighting. Only South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia remained as southern strongholds. The war was drawing to an end, an end brought on more rapidly as the men and ships of the Union Navy tightened their blockade, closing off such vital harbor cities as Mobile, Wilmington, and Charleston in naval battles of 1864 and early 1865. Also during the early weeks of 1865, Grant's forces had nearly encircled Petersburg and Richmond. Toward the end of March, the Union bombardment of Richmond began. This bombardment was planned to force General Lee and his troops to evacuate their last strongholds. Sadly, Lee gave the order to leave the Confederate capital. Quickly, Philip Sheridan, Grant's aide, moved in to cut off the retreating Confederates. On April 9, 1865, Robert E. Lee rode to the town of Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, to meet with Grant. In this house, Lee accepted the generous surrender terms offered by Ulysses S. Grant. The news of Lee's surrender was met with jubilation in the North. The war was over. The Union had been saved. But President Lincoln realized that genuine reunion with the southern states required generous terms of reconstruction. In his second inaugural address, he had promised, with malice toward none, with charity toward all, to bind up the nation's wounds. Lincoln was never to put his plans into action. For on April 14, 1865, in Ford's Theater in Washington, John Wilkes Booth shot and fatally wounded the president. The tragic war had claimed the last of its victims. But there were differences between North and South that war could not settle. Differences that would continue to divide North and South as the nation faced the aftermath of the Civil War, the work of reconstruction. <laughs>